Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, I will try to give you a, an overview on the impacts and uh, management strategies on invasive species more <coughs> with a gl global perspective. So you have listened to many presentations on the problems we have in Italy, the strategies to deal with this problem in Italy and Europe. But I give you a few insights of what uh, we are all doing uh, globally and how the problem is perceived at a global scale. First of all, I think this is something you have probably seen in other slides, in other presentations. It's important to remind that the data we have compiled over the years confirm that invasive species are the first or the second cause of extinctions globally. So the, the interest uh, of the conservation community on this threat has grown because we realize that this is a, a huge driver of extinction at the global level. And if we look at the IUCN red list data, you see all the different drivers of biodiversity loss. And for example, agriculture, um, use of resources are definitely uh, the major causes of biodiversity loss. But if we look at the extinctions that we know of, invasive species jump at the first place. So this is something that we uh, have understood only uh, in the last uh, few decades. But this is really a major problem in terms of species loss. It's even more uh, severe than the uh, hunting or the removal of species for, uh, for human use. Uh, so, just to give you an idea, we know that about 16% of all known extinctions are driven only by invasive alien species. And about 50% uh, of extinctions are sorry, driven also by invasive alien species. So this is really a major problem in terms of species loss. One number disappeared, sorry for that. And this is something that is affecting all environments, all regions of the world. So again, using the IUCN Red List, if we look at the habitats where invasive species are a major problem, you see that we have problems in the sea, in shrubland, in wetlands, in all terrestrial environments. So this is something that is affecting all the world and all the biomes of the world. Um, and it's also affecting disturbed but also undisturbed areas. This is one of the many uh, reviews that have addressed the main threats to protected areas. And there is a more, more recent one that is even more alarming. If you look at uh, a World Heritage Sites, so one of the classification of protected areas, you will see that invasive and other problematic species are one of the main problems for protected areas globally. This is just to say that even the less disturbed areas of the world, including remote islands, are particularly affected by invasive species. So it's not only a phenomenon that is affecting our cities or our human altered ecosystems. And islands are, of course, a major problem in the sense that even if islands occupy only a minor fraction of the global surface of Earth, about 5% of the globe, they contain a huge amount of biodiversity and most extinctions that we know of have happened on islands. And islands are particularly uh, vulnerable to invasions. So most extinctions that happen on islands have been caused by invasive species. We heard about the problems of islands um, in Italy, and that's quite a normal case. Just to give you an idea, 
on my desk in Italy, of course, any emergent problem uh, arrives. And uh, for example, in terms of species that are at risk of extinction in Italy, this is probably the most threatened vertebrate we have now. It's a small lizard. It only lives in five small populations in, uh, in a few islands close to Sicily. And there was a dramatic collapse in the largest of these populations when the Sicilian uh, wall lizard arrived in these small islands. So we lost in probably one year 80% of that, of that remnant population. So very often, you know, people are in Italy and elsewhere are more concerned with what they see more regularly, bears, wolves, whatever. But in most cases, the real problems that we have in terms of species loss happen on islands, happen to species that are threatened by introduced predators or competitors, or like in this case, similar species that can hybridize. But it's not only a problem affecting species. It, it can affect environments and also our life. There are many cases, for example, the beaver introduced uh, in uh, the very southernmost uh, uh, top of the uh, Latin American continent that has destroyed huge amounts of forests, or the prosopis, that is a, a, a thorny shrub uh, from Latin America that is uh, devastating Africa, or the water hyacinth that is impacting uh, the communities and environments of Africa because it totally destroys rivers and lakes. So it can have an impact on ecosystems, it can have an impact on our health. We heard about many cases where invasive species can either be vectors, parasites, pathogens impacting humans. Um, we know in Italy of the huge impact caused by the tiger mosquito that has been introduced accidentally uh, a few decades ago and is a vector of about 20 pathogens um, and of course, all this is causing huge economic losses. So we, you probably all know very well that there has been a report that has been uh, extremely important to convince decision makers to do a legislation in Europe. Uh, we estimated at least 12.5 billion uh, euros losses per year in Europe, but the real figure is probably much higher. We thought it could be around 30 billion. So it's a huge, uh, economic problem, not only an environmental problem, and not only in Europe. So many regions of the world are severely impacted by invasive species. So these are some of the data that we have showing a huge loss in terms of economic uh, for other regions of the world. But it's also important to <coughs> remember that um, invasive species impact many activities. For example, this is a recent review on the impact on agriculture caused by invasive species. The potential cost for the future could be huge for agriculture. And this is something that in this paper published in PNAS a couple of years ago, um, you could see that uh, in invasive species can have an impact, a very severe impact in terms of uh, um, proportion of uh, GDP, sorry, in, uh, in absolute uh, terms, and you can see that this is impacting many regions of the world, including many rich regions of the world. But if we look at the proportion of the impact on the GDP, you can see that many poor countries of the world, many countries in the developing world will be much more severely impacted because this is going to affect economies that are particularly vulnerable. So this is uh, a problem that even is, if it's more in absolute terms is probably more severe in uh, the richer parts of the world, this is already affecting and will affect the most vulnerable communities in the world. So it's not only environment, this is also impacting our life. And this is another important result uh, based on data we compiled in Europe. Very often, the very same species impacting the environment also impact the economy. So this is an area where protecting the environment can help 
the communities to protect their life and their economies. So this is an area where working on the environment can help the entire society. It's not a cost, it's an investment for our sustainable future. And this is another graph that you have probably seen. Uh, it, it is based on a paper that we published last year in Natural Communications based on many data compiled around the world showing that the number of invasive species is still growing everywhere in the world constantly. There is no saturation, no slowing down. And this is happening in all taxonomic groups from plants to vertebrates to invertebrates and in all regions of the world, North America, Africa, Asia, everywhere. So unfortunately, so far, we haven't managed to slow down or to halt uh, um, invasions. But we have some positive uh, elements. If we look at the increased rate, we see that in a couple of groups, mammals and fish, we see that the increased rate is slowing down. So these are the two groups where most often the introduction happens voluntarily. So Ilaria de Silvestre will, to will talk about uh, the regulation of pets. Very often mammals are introduced as pets, if we reduce the number of intentional introductions, uh, we can uh, really have an impact on the um, rates of invasions in some of these groups. And we already see some encouraging changes at the global scale. Uh, these are results based on a paper that we recently published in PNAS, based on the same database, where we try to analyze what were the new emerging uh, invasive species at the global scale. So the first, we measure the first records in new areas without considering species that are expanding, so the real new introductions. And you see there are a few species that uh, appear in many areas of the world, such as the domestic pigeon, crazy, crazy ant, and a few other species. But in most cases, new invasive species that we uh, record are really new, so they've, been not, they've not been introduced before in other areas. This can be used also to estimate how many potential invaders there are globally. And the numbers are quite uh, alarming. So we still have, for example, for mammals, um, a huge potential for new invasions. About 16% of mammals globally could become invasive in the future. So we, we are dealing with uh, a problem that is still uh, potentially uh, going to increase and we have to deal with it now. And this proportion is particularly high in mammals, in birds, in plants. So these are the areas where it's very important to develop more effective measures. And we also know that this problem might worsen in some areas of the world with climate change especially in Europe, in North America, in Australia, climate change can even worsen the problems caused by invasive species. We also know that there are emerging challenges. Just to, this is a paper published uh, again a couple of years ago, highlighting a few emerging risks. For example, the opening of the Arctic to uh, new shipping routes that could uh, create new invasions in a very vulnerable region the increase uh, num and the increased, uh, in tourism that is expected to double in the next few years, or the increase in e-commerce that is also expected to increase very rapidly in the next years. So it's definitely an area where we need to develop and enforce new and more effective policies. What do we need to do? We say in the last days that we focus a lot of presentations on eradications and control, but the real solution is only on prevention. We need to work more on prevention. This is really the most effective line of defense. And at the global scale, target nine of the biodiversity uh, strategy 2011-2012 says that we need to identify the priority pathways of introduction to focus prevention on them, and also to identify the most harmful species to focus management and eradication on, the, on those species. So prioritization is the key. 
However, if we look at the different targets of the biodiversity strategy and we look at target 9, invasive species, we are very far from uh, uh, having solved the problem. Uh, only 3% of the uh, indicators that we have show that we are on track to solve the problem. In most cases, what we've done is far from, from sufficient, so we haven't done enough. There are good examples of action and progresses, and for example, in Europe, the new regulation is indeed a major progress, even if we uh, call the European Union, including in this letter that was published in Nature, to, to, act, to be more active and to use this new tool in a, in a very effective way. And there are other good examples. Uh, we, have, um, we have used the example of New Zealand in the past many cases because New Zealand has a very stringent biosecurity policy and they managed to reduce the number of uh, invasions in their territory. They are also very effective in terms of eradications and management. However, there are also other examples uh, these are a few data. Uh, the paper you see on the left is a recent paper on non-native insects in New Zealand showing that after the introduction of a biosecurity policy, the number of invasive insects has, um, has, been, uh, um, uh, has grown much less than before. So biosecurity can be very effective. Also, the, the, the data we have for New Zealand that, was anal that were analyzed in the paper in Nature Communications, so that New Zealand has indeed uh, uh, um, slowed down uh, the invasion rate after the adoption of biosecurity policies. And we have encouraging results. So Ilaria, again, will tell us about this positive list. This means a different approach. Everything is regulated unless it is permitted. This is a much more stringent uh, approach, and this is something that has been recently implemented in Norway and in Iceland. So there are more and more countries in the world that are developing more stringent measures on invasive species. And this is definitely a very good news. But we need to focus more on prioritizing action. So what do we do to help decision makers to prioritize action? Within IUCN, we have worked at with other partners to help prioritizing pathways. So we have developed a classification of pathways of introduction that has been uh, endorsed by the Convention on Biological Diversity um, and has been uh, uh, agreed by m most uh, uh, international organizations. For example, the European Union is using this classification in the regulation on invasive species. This is incorporated into the database we host in ISPRA in Rome and that it is developed by IUCN Invasive Species Specialist Group. So all information that we have in these databases can be searched, mined, using this pathway classification. And this can help analyzing data to prioritize action. Um, and, if, and in fact, there have been many papers in the last few years uh, giving new insights, new information on the key pathways of introduction of invasive species based on this new classification. More in general, we have interlinked our databases with the other IUCN databases. For example, you now can have data on invasive species that are directly linked to the threatened species that are impacted by those uh, invasive species and you can link to directly from our database to the IUCN red list and vice versa. In the IUCN red list, you can see the uh, threats affecting each species and if it's one invasive species impacting the threatened species, you can link back to our database. And this interlink has permitted to improve our understanding of the impact of invasive species. For example, we use this data to produce a report for the European Commission in 2015 to show uh, the impact of invasive species in our continent. Now we are working, uh, those of you who were here uh, um, yesterday and the day before, uh, 
um, we mentioned some, uh, some speakers mentioned the ACAT approach to measuring impact of invasive species. This is something that has been requested by the Convention of Biological Diversity. So we have worked at this issue also with a political mandate, measuring the impact of invasive species. Also, this new approach is being uh, incorporated into our databases and is going uh, to help prioritizing action in the future. We are now working again also requested by the decision makers to classify also the socio-economic impacts of invasive species and also this information will be made available for um, decision making. So the idea that we are trying to follow on the international scale is to provide more um, um, updated information that can be used by decision makers to prioritize action because this is the best approach to reduce the impacts of invasive species. Prioritizing prevention and pri prioritizing management. Also in terms of where to act, so prioritizing the regions that are more vulnerable to invasions. This is another paper based on the interlink between uh, impact data and uh, threatened um, uh, environmental data. Of course, I say that prevention is the key, but eradication can also be an important tool for conservation. This paper of a couple of years ago clearly showed that eradication can help a lot of species to survive, and the case of the red squirrel in Perugia is clearly one uh, uh, clear case. We can do much more. If we think of the eradications that have been done for sanitary purposes, we managed to remove several diseases at the global scale. So if we uh, put enough commitment and resources in the environment, we could do much more than what we've done so far. And uh, one of the actions that we try to uh, focus is also to catalyze action by decision makers. So um, in 2016, we launched the Honolulu Challenge on Invasive Species, trying to encourage countries and global organizations to uh, put more resources and efforts in terms of species protection uh, from invasive species. Just to give you an idea, we managed to convince the UK government to invest about 3 million euros in, in their overseas territories, in very vulnerable islands in the world where biosecurity policies are uh, urgently needed and uh, for example New Zealand is investing huge amounts of resources we are talking of about three billion dollars uh, to um, uh, combat several pests that are devastating the biodiversity of that country uh, so uh, New Zealand has launched a predator free 2050 campaign and uh, the government has decided to invest uh, huge resources to uh, uh, meet this very ambitious target. Um, there are many new tools. Uh, for example, Gene Drive is a potentially powerful new tool. It's also risky, so we need to be very careful. We are discussing with other organizations how to progress. So with these new gene tools, we could develop much more powerful weapons to combat invasive species. For example, with gene tools, uh, it could be possible in the next few years to develop um, ways to combat um, mosquitoes in Africa and malaria. I just remind you that malaria kills about 1 million people every year and costs about 12 billion euros per year in Africa alone. Uh, at the same time, of course, these new tools pose risk and we need to be very careful in what we develop. Uh, so we need to uh, consider questions of risk assessments, ethical questions, and for preparing to assess the opportunity for actual applications. This is quite a delicate discussion, of course. I close it here and thank you very much for your attention and I hope I didn't take too much time. <laughs>